So thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Thank you for turning up, and thanks for the intro. Uh, yeah, as you said, I, I've been to Colt several times, at least um, uh, mean frequencies every five years or so, but sometimes more frequent than that. So uh, when I, uh, the title is not quite that, but that's the title of the first slide. But when I decided to talk about randomized algorithms and linear algebra, I had a choice. There's a lot of stuff, and I could either go into detail into quite a bit of it by just mentioning the results, or I could give you an overview. So I thought I would give a high-level picture, so some of the experts here will be bored, perhaps. Um, I also, listening to the other talks and so on, I'm, I'm amazed, I'm impressed with the amount of detail this audience can absorb online. So maybe there isn't quite that much detail here, but we'll, I have one or two uh, semi-complete stories uh, through, through the development, and otherwise it's a survey. Uh, so we'll start with, uh, uh, with a sort of uh, flashy intro in some sense, but if uh, I went back about 25 years and asked somebody at Fox or Stock, a random theory person, uh, not a random qualifies the person, not theory, right? So the random person, which of these following four things I'm going to put up, just an arbitrary selection of topics, would scale up and get applied to very large problems in 25 years. Let's see what the answer you think would be was. The first one is, of course, singular value decomposition. This is planted. Singular value decomposition and other linear algebra algorithms. The second one is um, network flows, graph algorithms, shortest path, and things like that. Graph algorithms, which uh, gets much more play, or has definitely historically got much more play in Fox and Stock and Soda than SVD, perhaps. Uh, third one is data structures, sophisticated data structures on which, again, uh, there's more um, you find in these conferences. And the last one is optimization. And you all know the answer, so uh, let, me, let me tell you what, it's not a surprise. I think the answer would have been, I'm, I'm going out on a limb here, the answer would have been quite often two and three going back to the 90s. Uh, whereas, I want to assert that um, again, here I'm going out on a limb. In reality, what's happened, what's uh, panned out is that perhaps one and four have scaled up more and have been applied more widely uh, than people would have guessed in the 90s. And there are several reasons for that. The most important reason is that we have centuries of continuous mathematics helping us, uh, certainly decades uh, in, in uh, those uh, areas, in one and um, four, right? Uh, the Two and three, I'm not an anti-discrete person per se, but I think it is true that the theory community has focused rather more exclusively on discrete than continuous, and they're both important. Um, certainly in learning, uh, machine learning, the continuous stuff has turned out to be very important. But more, Im more interestingly, what I find is that working on these discrete problems, I'm handicapped. I don't have uh, sort of background or techniques or results, but in the continuous stuff, there's a lot more that we can draw on. So maybe that's one of the reasons. The other reason, uh, many reasons, but the other one reason I'm going to focus a little bit on this talk is randomized algorithms. Randomization helps uh, quite a bit. It does also help in the discrete problems, but in these settings it helps, seems to help quite a bit, as we'll see. Okay. Uh, so uh, SVD in learning, uh, you're all no stranger to SVD. It's used widely in learning. I just put up one slide so that uh, people don't feel they invited me by mistake. It's, I mean, it has something to do with this conference, right? SVD certainly is widely. Uh, topic modeling and clustering are two examples. Uh, there are many nice theorems, but I want to mention one uh, beautiful theorem of Impala and Wong. It's really actually folklore just as fact, but the use of it is theirs. Uh, that if you have a mixture of spherical Gaussians, um, I want to find the subspace spanned by their means that helps me later in the algorithm finding the components, and indeed, that is, that is the SVD subspace. It, when you're given infinitely many samples, if you're finitely many samples, it's approximately that. So SVD helps you find that space, and then you project to it and do an algorithm. I mean, it's not my objective to go through the algorithm here. Okay. Non-negative matrix factorization, which is somewhat similar in spirit to SVD, perhaps, but you want non-negative uh, entries in the matrix, that, in the factors. And that's something also where SVD is used. Um, these are things that were more to whet your appetite there. I'm not going to go over details of these at all. 
right? Most of the talk is focusing on linear algebra and singular value decomposition and things like that. For people in the theory community, this, uh, uh, this slide is obvious, but also probably for most of you, but I want to jog your memory just. So who tosses coins? Uh, either the algorithm could toss coins. That's come to be known as randomized algorithms. In other words, it has a random number generator. Or, uh, 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 sorry, and the data now, in this setting, the data is worst case. So you want to assert that the expected running time for the worst case input is at most something. And it, you know it accomplishes certain error bounds, right? Uh, the other case is the average case analysis with the data tosses coins, if you will. That just means the data is random. Um, the algorithm may be deterministic. You could combine the two. Um, <coughs> in this talk, we'll focus mostly on one. This question will come up, so I'm going to assert results. Uh, they, will be, they will hold for every matrix, right? Not just for uh, random matrices, not just for matrices with high probability. And this is more useful. We are going to talk, random sampling is going to be used for very large matrices, massive matrices. So for instance, a web connection graph or some other matrices like that. These are singular, I don't mean um, determinant zero. I mean, they are peculiar matrices for one particular application. So it's often difficult to form a stochastic model. So we don't want to talk about average case. We want things to work for that one matrix that I'm interested in, right? So it better work for the worst case. That's what most of our theorems will say. Okay. Why randomized algorithms? Again, the answer is perhaps obvious, but I want to, s but there are two aspects to it. One is completely obvious. The other one maybe uh, I want to put in context. So you have lots of non-zero entries and um, time is important. If you spent order n cubed time on an n by n by n, n, by n matrix, n cubed is too big. So we want the samples to reduce the size so that we can save on time. Perhaps the other thing that uh, one might not think of right away is space is also important because you cannot store these big matrices in RAM. If you take uh, the general framework for algorithms in theory, you say you access an edge in a graph or an entry of a matrix in unit time. You cannot do that unless, unless it's random access, right? So we assume that the matrix is not doesn't fit into random access. So uh, here's a definition of massive data or big data. What is big data? Well, something that doesn't fit into RAM, right? So that's what most of our matrices will be. Um, a simple randomized algorithm scheme, that, that can be a lot of complicated things, Sim simple randomized algorithm scheme just computes on a sample of rows and columns of the matrix. Okay? This is good if we have two things. One, we need, first, a proof of an error guarantee that computing on the sample, computing certain quantities on the sample, maybe singular values, will give you a good approximation to what they are for the whole matrix. We better have that. Um, and secondly, uh, <coughs> we must be able to do this sampling quickly. It beats the purpose if the sampling itself takes more time or space uh, than doing the problem in the original, right? So we should do what I will call sampling on the fly the word on the fly should suggest perhaps streaming, and in some sense it's like that, except we'll be slightly more relaxed. We'll allow multiple passes, not just one pass, right? And uh, little towards the end, uh, we'll also see situations where the input data may be distributed among various servers. And randomization in the first part was used to sample. But in the second part, we'll see randomization crucially helps in reducing the communication between the servers. Okay, that's another another use of randomization. Uh, there are two uh, scenarios that you can imagine. One scenario that I've talked about so far that should be in the back of your mind is there is the matrix somewhere. Maybe you haven't written it down in RAM, but it exists somewhere. Maybe in external memory like the web connection matrix, the algorithm draws samples from that matrix, existing matrix. There's another scenario where the matrix really doesn't exist at all in, in full. Only a sample of entries are known. I mean, you all know the Netflix challenge where you only knew a sample. Recommendation systems, uh, which people like, which products, you, it's very expensive to collect the entire matrix. Nobody does that. You only have a sample of the matrix. But these are, uh, even though they are different in practice, you would think the same methods apply to both. 
and indeed that's true, except for the second part, uh, we need to know some handle on the probability distribution with which somebody picked a sample and gave it to you, right? Otherwise, you cannot do that. Uh, if, if, if they gave you, if it was an adversarial choice, not much you can do. Here, mostly we think of one, okay? But two is essentially the same as one. One means we, we assume, we pretend conceptually the matrix is somewhere and we are drawing samples. Okay, so here again is the setting. By the way, the beginning few slides I tried to be very sort of general and uh, fast. We, we will have some meat as we go along. Um, so, so far it's just generalities, right? So, we have an M by N matrix, which uh, the dimensions are large. We want to do S independent identical trials. In each trial, we pick a random column of A. Having picked it, we are allowed to scale the column. So, we multiply the whole vector, columns of vector, by a scalar. We are allowed to do that. And after we do that, uh, we throw away, if you will, the big matrix and only compute with the sampled S columns. So S is always going to stand for sample size, so S columns. Right? So here's a little picture. So the matrix looks like that. If I'm going to sample columns, uh, I get a tall, thin matrix on which I compute. Okay? It could have been rows. We'll see that also sampling rows would be useful. Okay? So uh, there's a bunch of problems. I won't talk about every problem every time, but these methods apply to a whole bunch of problems. Uh, but I will mention what happens. The first and the simplest one is matrix multiplication. And the one story I'm going to carry out through the talk, because it has connections to a lot of things, is just AA transpose. Take a matrix A, very large matrix. I want to multiply it by its transpose. And that looks like a very particular question. I'll try to make a case that it's not. It's actually a very nice question and uh, spend some time on that. That's one story. More generally, you could multiply two matrices A and B. Uh, you want to do singular value decomposition. Uh, more precisely, you want to do low rank approximation. I don't want the full SVD. Usually, I want the top few uh, singular vectors and low rank approximation. Um, we'll also talk about matrix sketches, which are compact representations of a matrix. Uh, the, the sample of columns might be, we'll see that's not quite enough, but we'll see compact representations of a matrix. Uh, we'll also look at graph falsification, which is a more recent application of these sampling techniques um, due to Spielman and Srivastava and others. We'll, we'll, that'll be part of a longer story, I will tell you. Linear regression. Um, <coughs> uh, a brief, uh, we'll, these methods do apply to tensors as well, and we'll see a brief slide on that. Um, and I want to remind you of two things. There's no free lunch. Uh, we only have samples. We are not going to be able to get the exact answer, right? You can't get the exact answer with samples, but there's some approximation, and we want to pin down what the approximation is. Okay? But we'll prove bounds on the... Uh, just looking at the time. Okay, good. Uh, I want... So, as I said, uh, uh, I don't want to put a lot of notation in front of you, but some. Uh, just three or four. That's the Frobenius norm is the sum of squares of all the entries. Uh, sub two is the spectral norm, which is, uh, you know, the operator norm. Um, and A is always going to be M by N. I'll keep that. And um, S is always going to be the number of sample columns, S for sample. Okay. This, this is all the notation that uh, I hope you'll remember. I'll remind you. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Low rank approximation with additive error. So the first sort of uh, solid theorem I'll state for you. Uh, we want to find uh, uh, rank k approximation a star to a. Okay. We know how to do that with SVT, but we don't want to do that. We are allowed a little uh, leave a compared to SVT. So a minus a star in Frobenius norm. There are also bounds in Spectral norm, I won't state them here, but for some other things I would state them. We want SVD's uh, best possible result, but I'm going to allow you an extra error, which is additive, as it says, which is epsilon times the Frobenius norm of A, which, which is this uh, sampling error, if you will. That's going to be because of sampling. Uh, so let me, without further ado, state the first theorem. Um, 
as long as s is, so, so there is some polynomial in k and epsilon. So this is a sample size. It doesn't depend on m or n, that's very important. It depends only on the error parameter epsilon and the rank k you seek. Okay? k is to be thought of as much smaller than m and n. So there are some polynomials so that if you pick this many samples, but you cannot pick these samples uniformly at random. You can all convince yourselves that's very simple. So if I picked columns uniformly at random, I may get nothing. The best example to think of there is a matrix is basically all zeros except for two columns which are non-zero. Okay? And unless you see those two columns, all you can say about the matrix is it's an all zero matrix, okay? which is not a good approximation. So you got to see those two columns. So you must sample with probabilities that depend on the column. It turns out it's going to depend on the squared length of the columns. Probability is proportional to that. Why squared length and not cube length, we'll see. Squared length is important. Um, and um, uh, if, if that is true, then you can, then this, then this result follows, right? I didn't tell you how to, how to find A star from the sample, but the theorem is you can do that, okay? Reasonably fast. So as long as you pick this many sample columns with length squared probabilities, you are home. You get this result, okay? It's not simple. I, I won't be able to prove it or indicate a proof, but at least that's the theorem. Now, you can ask, why is this interesting at all? This error might be too much. It's only interesting if epsilon times the Frobenius norm is less than the other term, which is really what you want. And um, if you're familiar with principal component analysis, uh, which is what often SVD is used for, it's not the only thing, it's often what SVD is used for. In PCA, the matrices either are essentially low rank, so the top few singular values dominate, or at least the top few singular values together form a constant fraction of the spectrum in both cases, this is true. So for PCA matrices, for instance, this, this result is meaningful. Okay. Um, so length squared sampling was introduced in this paper that we did in 1998. That's where this theorem is from. Um, since it has found a bunch of other, uh, quite a lot of applications, but also many improvements, um, some of which I will, I, will, I will talk about, but not, uh, I mean, the dot, dot, dot really contains a whole lot of literature. Um, there was also, there is also an alternative scheme of reducing the complexity of the matrix due to Acleoptus and Meksheri first again, which has received some work, uh, where you draw a sample of entries, set the unsampled entries to zero. So entries that you sampled, you would scale them in some way, but the entries that you didn't sample, you would zero them out. Now this doesn't reduce the dimension. So this reduced the dimension, right, because we got S instead of um, N. But here it doesn't reduce the dimension. The, the matrix remains M by N, but it becomes sparser, so easier to compute. And there are some results known for uh, that kind of sampling as well, which I won't tell you much about. Uh, okay, so why length squared? Uh, here's a simple reason why length squared. Uh, and this is one story I'm going to uh, pursue a little bit, AA transpose, uh, just multiplying A with its transpose. So a transpose you can write as the column J of A times the row J of A, outer product, sum of outer products. And now when you see a sum and you uh, are thinking about randomized, well, you might as well estimate this whole sum by taking a sample of J and summing them. Okay? That's what you'd like to do. It's a natural thing to try to do. And uh, so you do IID trials. Each trial is, again, not uniform. so. There's a probability PJ of picking column J in each of the trials. What are good PJ, you'll ask, okay? And it turns out that, uh, first of all, uniform sampling is no good. I already told you this example, okay? Uh, uh, and the scale, this is the scaling that you need to make it unbiased. So the estimator is I pick a J with probabilities PJ, and if you, if you divide by one over PJ, it becomes unbiased. That's the scaling. Okay. Easy to check. I won't check that. But perhaps a little more uh, work, but really just calculus is, will show that if I take the variance of this estimator and minimize the variance, the correct PJ or the minimizing PJ are proportional to squared length. Okay. So this is a, a basic reason why you would use squared length. Okay. Uh, in addition, it turns out it has a lot of nice properties that uh, we won't prove. Um, with the average of S samples, you can prove just by the variance estimate that you get this. That is. 
I want to get A A transpose, and I estimate it by just the average of S of these unbiased estimators. That estimate, the Frobenius norm, goes down to zero as S goes to infinity at this rate, okay, in expectation. For every matrix, again, that's always for every matrix, right? For every matrix, the expected value is, is uh, behaves like this, yeah? Oh, if you, if you don't know the length of, so the question is, how do I know the PJ? How do I know the length of the matrix? So we'll see in a minute. Yeah, yeah. yes, of course, you have to know them. Yeah, But we'll see in a minute. Uh, before I say that, I, I should say, this whole thing holds even if you know PJ within constant factors. You can be off by a factor. That's still OK. So this is from a paper. So uh, the way to think of this is matrix multiplication if S is constant, throughout our talk, S will be just constant because S depends only on, doesn't depend on M and N. So if S is constant, this is order N squared, basically, time matrix multiplication, approximate matrix multiplication of A and A transpose, right? Of course, it depends on S. Okay, so maybe to answer the question about how to compute PJ, so uh, here is, in general, the data handling picture. So I said they cannot store it in RAM. So how do we do the PJ? So massive data, too large to be stored in RAM. What do we do? Um, here's a simplified model. We measure three resources, RAM, time, and space, as usual. That's a traditional time and space. But we also worry about the number of passes. So a pass is the only way to access the matrix, because it's not random access, is a sequential read of the entire matrix. This is a very simplified, idealized view of how you access a very large matrix. Let's say I have to read through the whole thing even if I want one entry, right? So I would rather not do that too many times. Um, the sampling process, uh, many of them I'm going to talk about in this talk, not all of them, will only make a constant number of passes. Uh, so the first pass here computes the probability. So in one pass I can compute the probabilities by taking some of squares of each row or column, and in the second pass I sample. Okay. So in RAM I hold only a constant number of, um, of the, the sample rows or columns. That's all I hold in RAM. Okay. Uh, now, if you have a picture of the matrix, you can do it with just one pass, but let's, we won't go into that. Um, now, low rank approximation can even be carried out, again, in one pass or streaming model. There's a bunch of different algorithms which we won't talk about, for instance, one due to Edo, uh, which is a vector version of frequent data mining. Again, I won't uh, talk about that. That's not randomized. In some sense, different in spirit. Okay. Also, we can do length squared sampling first to pick these columns, then again do length squared sampling to pick rows. We can repeat this process and get down to a constant size matrix, put it in RAM. But the proof that this second stage of sampling also works is much more complicated. So for now, think of just one stage of length squared and I have a constant number of entire columns or rows in RAM. I could also go down to just a constant size in RAM with more difficulty. The proof is harder. Okay. So sketch of a matrix. So uh, I, I promise you that we can uh, make a sketch of the matrix for future use. Uh, now, how do you sketch a matrix? Suppose we pick just a sample of rows or just a sample of columns they cannot form a stretch of a matrix because the sample of rows tells us nothing about the unsampled rows. They could be anything, right? Similarly with columns. Okay. But how about a sample of rows and columns? We'll see that the answer is yes. So the moral of this story is, I'm going to tell you at the end of the slide, it will be a theorem, which says that for any matrix at all, if I give you a sample of rows and a sample of columns, then that gives a complete sketch of the matrix, an approximation to the whole matrix. We'll see how. Okay. Um, first, suppose A has rank K. First, intuition, and then I'll tell you the term. First, suppose A has very small rank, K, let's say, K is 10 or something. Then if I pick 100 K rows, that should pin down the row space of A, if it's in general position. This is just intuition, right? But still doesn't know, for the unsampled row, what linear combination it is. But suppose we also pick 100k columns in addition to 100k rows. So I pick the tall, I should have drawn pictures, it takes too much time, but 100k columns. 
now intuitively, if the rows are in general position, each row in the 100K version should be a unique linear combination. So that really pins down the combinations. Right? Okay, but I want to state the theorem on this slide, excuse me. So uh, the, uh, the, again, the moral of the story is if I pick length squared sample of rows and a length squared sample of columns together, they form a sketch of the entire matrix. You, you, you know approximately what the matrix is. A is M by N. Let's say C is an M by S matrix, S columns, formed by sampling and scaling. But according to length squared is important. R is, it turns out, so this is going to be a little bit, a little complicated. It's not S by N, it's root S by N. It's important that there is a difference here. Um, root S rows picked according to length squared also. Given just the columns and rows, I'll have a picture in a minute, but given just the columns and rows, we can find the S by root S matrix U to put in the middle, so that maybe I should give you the picture. Yeah, here's a picture, sorry. So I'm going to take this matrix. I'm going to approximate it by a sample of columns and a sample of rows, except the dimensions don't work out. I'll be able to compute a matrix U to put in between so that the dimensions work out. And uh, the assertion is the expected value. Now, I stated only for the operator norm here, spectral norm. Uh, something is true also for the Frobenius norm, but I state only for spectral norm. Uh, in expectation, the spectral norm of the error goes down to zero, as you would hope, with root s again. But here is the error, right? So this, it is important that the rows and columns are picked according to length squared. It's not true for other probability distributions. So uh, this was proved first in a paper in 2002. There's been a lot of work on this, including a beautiful uh, sort of tour de force uh, last year by Batsedis and Woodruff, who can do the CUR approximation, uh, uh, optimal in almost everything. They can do it in optimal time. The optimal time is linear in the number of non-zero entries of the matrix. And they can do it optimally in the size of U as well. I will not be able to say, uh, that, so there's a lot of papers of Woodruff and Clarkson and Butsidis. I wish I could describe them to you, but I'll describe some salient features uh, that include uh, some description of this paper later on. So uh, basically, uh, before I pass on, so all this is saying is that a sample of rows and sample of columns is good enough to approximate the matrix. Yeah? Okay, good question, no, it's false, yeah. So uh, putting um, spectral norm here is not going to work, putting Frobenius norm here is not going to work. With Frobenius norm, something else works, but not quite, yeah. Basically those things fail because there are essentially high rank, high rank matrices like the identity, which you cannot approximate by uh, anything good. Okay. Applications of CUR, Traditional SVD gives you, uh, for a matrix A, the best rank approximation. There are two issues. One is running time is uh, high. The second issue is it's not what's called interpolative. This is nicely illustrated by an application some of these guys pursued. So if you're given the gene patient matrix, whatever that is, doesn't matter. Uh, you do SVD on the matrix and then you go and tell the biologist the principal component is combination of patients some with negative weights and some with fractional weights. So the biologist doesn't like fractional patients or fractional genes or negative patients or negative genes. What a CUR lets you do is that it's interpolative. It tell, you can go and tell the biologist, here are some patients, here are some genes. It's enough to look at them. That's the gist of what you can do. And in fact, this was pursued in a paper that Dranayas and Mahoney wrote in, in a genetics journal. Um, and so it has a, a nice interpretation ring to this. It's also used in databases. Christos Philistos has a bunch of applications. I won't actually describe uh, any of the applications, partly because I, you know you will figure out that I'm a theory person if I did that uh, clearly. Okay, so I want to continue the AA transpose story. So um, now uh, in this slide, you're going to deal with an infinite matrix A that comes from probability distribution. So uh, AA transpose and the variance covariance matrix. That's the title. So P is a probability distribution maybe a density or discrete on RD. Let's assume the mean is zero. Okay. The variance covariance matrix M has, is N by N, sorry, D by D, excuse me, 
i j density is the expected value under p of x i times x j, right? You pick an x with probability density p and you do this, right? So uh, a, let's think of a for this context as a d by infinity matrix where I put down every possible column but weighted suitably by its probability. So I list basically all the possible um, uh, all the possible elements in the sigma algebra, right? So uh, the variance along one particular direction v, v is a vector in d space, is just this, is standard. So we transpose a length squared is the variance along one direction. Okay. Now, uh, here's a question. How many IID samples do you need according to p? Or each sample is drawn according to p. Will suffice to estimate the variance to what we will call relative er error along each direction. So you're all familiar with variance covariance matrices, and you, you all know that if I draw infinitely many samples in the limit, I get an accurate estimate of the matrix. But I want to pin down a particular way of measuring error, which is going to be important, right? So here's what I want to do. Uh, I want to sample, I want to sample a finite uh, number of samples to form a submatrix B, so that I want absolutely for every vector, the this is a standard deviation. The standard deviation, the direction v, to be represented by the empirical standard deviation. That's just on b. So the real standard deviation and the empirical standard deviation, or with an epsilon relative error. That's very important. Relative error of each other. So if if you're doing linear regression, you want a direction along which the variance is very small and then the right-hand side, the error allowed is very small. So it becomes difficult to do this, right? If, if, the, if the entire density lies on one plane, you have to find it, the exact plane. Okay. So this problem in this particular error formulation arose in volume computation is a problem we formulated uh, maybe 20 years ago. Um, it was beautifully solved by Rudelson, and I want to talk about the solution, right? So we saw in the previous slide if I did length squared sampling, AA transpose, I get this kind of error. Okay. What um, Rudelson and Vershinin proved um, using a technique called decoupling, which some of you have seen, it's a beautiful technique from probability and functional analysis, they proved something that looks like a technical modification. Uh, believe me, it's not. It's a beautiful uh, and a very important modification. So you put the spectral norm here, and on the right hand side, one of the Frobenius norm terms gets replaced by spectral norm, okay? And, and that exact form of it is important. So uh, it's much more than a technical improvement. Now there are simpler proofs which don't use decoupling. For instance, if you're familiar with uh, matrix hefting churn of inequalities, there's again a nice paper of TROPS, a survey paper which gives you these inequalities. You can prove them, you can prove that with that. You don't need decoupling, okay? So. The rudelson vershinin theorem, it turns out, implies that if you have a log concave probability density on RD, order star, that means in, uh, hide some log factors, order star D samples suffice to answer that question, to answer the relative error question. Uh, so this actually was a um, culmination of a bunch of work uh, by Pizier and Bourguin. They, they had proved worse bounds, but rudelson vershinin proved this. Yeah. Again. All I've said, so if you don't have to remember the details, but it's an estimate on how well you can do AA transpose, right? Now, uh, it's also related, it turns out, uh, about 20 years later, it was also related to something called uh, graph falsifiers that Spielman and Srivats were defined or studied. So in the following way. So here's a graph. You have a graph with n nodes and m edges. Uh, let's call AG the node edge incidence matrix, one node per row one column per edge. Again, pictures would have been useful, but time consuming to draw. They want a sparser graph H. They want to pick a subset of edges, okay, hopefully linear number of edges, so that every cut is approximately correct. What that means is on every cut, you have roughly the same weight of edges in H as in G. Okay? And this, uh, was, uh, this problem was formulated by Bensur and Karga but a stronger version was formulated by Spielman and Srivatsva who wanted what are called spectral sparsifiers, those are these things, which have to satisfy, you may not remember, it's the same condition as for the variance covariance matrix. 
So it's exactly the same condition as the variance covariance matrix. And uh, uh, same question of approximating the variance covariance matrix. And uh, Rudelson and Vershinin helps you do that as well. It says that you, you, if you choose a random H, okay, according to length squared, some length squared, and I'll come back to that, then you get this kind of result. And, and it turns out that um, uh, this is only good. This is not good enough. I want relative error. This is not the right hand side wants to be uh, one plus or minus epsilon times that, but you have a spectral norm here. But this would be good enough if A of G is an isometry, and in fact that's what we will do. So this is what Speedman and Srivatsva did. So I'm going to call this preconditioned length squared sampling. This is going to come up again. Uh, these are basically leverage scores in statistics. Uh, another nice connection. Uh, so, but sorry, excuse me. Let me go back here. So, what I want to do, my aim now is to say, if I make A G into an isometry, length-preserving map, then I can apply Rudelson version, and and I get this. Okay. Again, don't um, have to work out all the details on the spot, but just believe me that that's true. I want to make A G an isometry. So here's what I do. I take the matrix uh, A, which is AG, and I take the pseudo-inverse. Pseudo-inverse just makes uh, W times A an isometry on the column space of A. Okay? If you multiply it, it becomes a length-preserving map. Okay? And now I sample columns of A according to length squared probabilities on the isometry. So once I make it an isometry, I can apply Rudel's inversion in, and I sample on the columns of this. Okay? And uh, so these are length squared probabilities based on applying the pseudo inverse, right? So I'm calling it preconditioning because in numerical analysis, preconditioning is more or less this, that you would pre-multiply by something that looks like the inverse, right? It's very good for a lot of numerical computations. So uh, you repeat this S times, sample a column with probabilities proportional to the preconditioned length squared, but then you sample columns of A not the preconditioned matrix, and forms that uh, forms B. And um, then it turns out this is true by Rudelson and Vershinin. Okay, All of this, this is true for any matrix A. So you can take any matrix A, get this relative error bound. So uh, please bear with me. You don't have to remember the exact form of this. The moral of this story is you can take any matrix, make it an isometry, by multiplying by its inverse, and then sample according to the probabilities, you get a nice relative error bound. Okay? This you can do for any matrix. So you can take any matrix with infinitely many columns or uh, finite but large number of columns and sparsify it. So B uh, is a sample of columns compared to A. It's much fewer, right? You can sparsify it. But the difficulty is computing PJ involves computing the pre-inverse, uh, computing the um, pseudo-inverse, and preconditioning, And that's time consuming. What Spielman and Spreosoy showed is that for Laplacians of matrices, for node edge frequency adjacency matrix of a graph, this can be done on linear time. They did this by striking a beautiful connection to electrical resistance and these probabilities. So these probabilities turn out for graphs to be essentially electrical resistances. It's an interesting open question. We don't know an answer. Are there other interesting classes of matrices for which PJ can be computed fast. That is, are there other interesting classes of matrices, perhaps matrices with just three entries per column for which you can do preconditioned length squared sampling? If we don't know, that, that, that would be interesting then to apply it to those things too. Okay, so these preconditioned length squared samplings are basically leverage scores. That's a fact that's quite useful. So uh, Rudelson version, and uh, just a, again interpreted, says that we can assert that I said order n samples, but order star rank will do, turns out, right? But the rank can be big. So can we say one this rank? So here's an answer to that. So A might have very big rank, n, right? So we, we don't want to sample something like n things. For grass falsifiers, we do. But in general, we would like to say one that is possible. Get worse error, of course. Okay. So what we do for this is first do SVD 
to find the rank K approximation to A, that's AK. Okay. Then use preconditioned length squared probabilities of AK. Okay. If you did that, since now the rank is only K, you need only order star K samples instead of order N okay, to do AA transpose, essentially, right? So this was pursued by Dunayas, Mahoney, and Mutukashan, and they proved a theorem which says if you have poly K over uh, samples of A drawn according to now preconditioned on AK, so it requires doing an SVD beforehand, we can get a very good approximation with this kind of relative error. Okay. Now, here, the error on the right-hand side became relative in the sense it's 1 plus epsilon times this. Earlier, the simpler schemes only had an additive error. Now they have a relative error, epsilon times that. OK, so uh, I'm going to give you, um, uh, I should have given you more pictures, but I'm going to give you one picture on the next slide. Uh, an alternative way, it turns out, to get the same theorem, to get this kind of theorem. So here, we had to do the SVD, and then get the leverage scores from preconditioning AK. Instead, if you draw a sample, not of one row or column at a time, but we take poly k over epsilon sets of poly k over epsilon columns, the probabilities now want to be proportional to the square of the volume of the simplex spanned by them. I think I'll give you a picture. Uh, this is called volume sampling. We saw a beautiful talk uh, a little earlier. In fact, I was going to put an advertisement to the talk, then I realized is going to happen earlier than my talk, which is the second talk in the last session on determinantal processes. Uh, uh, and after telling you, after giving you a picture, I'll tell you what this is. So, you want to pick a bunch of columns at one shot. You take the simple expand by them. You take the volume. You take the square of the volume, and that's what you want to sample according to. So, I think they all, the other talk also had a Jaguar picture. So, this um, this is a uh, what is this? This is just illustrating volume sampling. So uh, this is because, see, if you did a search for the word Jaguar, it has at least two meanings. Uh, one meaning the car, unfortunately, dominates. So if you want to know about the animal, you don't get so many vectors, and they're not uh, so big, right? Now, if I did length squared sampling, that if I picked, let's say, vectors with probability proportional to the squared length, there are many more of the car, and they are longer even, perhaps, or there are many more. So you keep getting the car. You will not see the Jaguar. But instead, if I said, I'm going to be pick pairs of vectors with probability proportional to the area squared of the triangle you span, then I will get one of these and one of these as two vectors. Right? I won't pick two of these, because the angle is very small. So they don't span. Uh, their area of the triangle spanned by them is not very high. Whereas if I picked one of these, one of these, I'll get a high, high area squared, actually, is what I want. Right? By the way, the area squared here, uh, in the other talk, it was the determinant. They are the same, because th that talk is about taking a transpose and, and doing that. Okay. So now, the trouble with this uh, algorithm, you can say, is it might take n to the k time. I have to enumerate n to the r time. I have to enumerate all these r tuples to figure out which one to do. That was the case, perhaps, in the beginning. There were quite a lot of improvements due to uh, the original authors themselves. But then you saw a linear time algorithm just today, right? Where now we can do determinantal sampling in time, which is linear in n. There's no exponent on n. Okay. Good. Uh, so I'm going to do one. I'm going to now go off. That's all to do with AA transpose now. No more of that. Uh, a brief mention of tensors. So uh, tensors, or you know what they are, but so. I suppose I have a tensor, and I want to maximize. Here's an interesting problem. I want to maximize uh, the cubic form if it's a three tensor, R form if it's an R tensor over unit length vectors. This is like finding the top singular vector, right, for a matrix. Uh, this is hard. It's NP hard in general to do it exactly. Um, so here's a theorem based on sampling. For any epsilon, we can find in polynomial time a Y, which is approximately optimal in this following sense. It achieves the best possible minus epsilon times the Frobenius norm. So there is an additive error, right? not relative, additive error. Okay. Frobenius norm is again the sum of squares of all the entries. Okay. 
I won't describe this except to say uh, somewhere in the middle of this you have to do length squared sampling. So this is also based on length squared sampling okay. inside the tensor. Uh, and of course, uh, for tensors, it's an active area now, right? We know much better results if you make assumptions. For general tensors, I'm not sure I know anything better than this. For, uh, uh, for instance, if the tensor is made up of orthogonal rank one tensor decomposition, there are uh, results that both do it and use it. Here's a paper by Ankumar by some of the people here, uh, Daniel and Animar here, um, and others. But there are quite a number of results on these uh, with conditions. Okay. Okay. Now, I want to describe, uh, so somehow the choice was either I give you the latest stuff, uh, but perhaps uh, lose everybody but the experts, or I give you a history. Now, I gave you so far a history, a uh, couple of slides on later stuff, uh, which unfortunately will be very fast, but I'll try to describe it. Um, so here is a, a nice result of the last few years. Um, let's look at a particular matrix, particular random matrix called the count sketch matrix. This is the following kind of matrix. So has a single non-zero entry in each column. And the way you pick the entry is you pick a random row for each column. And in that row, you put a plus one or a minus one probability half each. So it's a very sparse matrix. Every column is only one non-zero. And it's either a plus one or a minus one. Uh, this was studied in the context of streaming by several authors. Here's a, uh, a, a Das Gupta, Kumar, and Sarlo studied that. And then um, Clarkson and Woodruff, who've done a number of nice results. This was a stock 2013 best paper. And they showed the following. If A is any M by N matrix, again, now this is interesting only in the case it's tall 10, lots more rows than columns. S is a count sketch matrix. Now, uh, S is going to pre-multiply A. So it's got to be something by M. It's going to have T rows where T is small, okay? because N is small. right? M is the big quantity. N is small. Then they prove that with high probability, simultaneously for every X, for every vector X, no exceptions, okay, the length of S A trans S A X is in relative error close to the length of AX. Okay? The proof is by an epsilon net argument. Uh, but it's got to be true for every X, because the idea now is uh, once you find SA, then you do low rank approximation, let's say, just on SA, which is much smaller. Okay? The low rank approximation on SA is going to give you a vector X. And you would hope that that serves well as a singular, near singular vector of A. So you don't know which, actor, which X is going to come out. It's conditioned on S. So you better have this hole for every X. What I just said is not quite true because these relative errors add up. So it's not as simple as just taking S A and then finding the low rank approximation of this. Okay. So uh, these uh, S's are called subspace embedding matrices because they embed A into a smaller dimensional subspace and the lengths are preserved but they're preserved for every x. In another paper, uh, Clarkson and Woodruff also showed low rank approximation, regression, matrix multiplication, and optimal algorithms. All of this in time which is optimal, that is linear in the number of non-zeros. Right? So you cannot do better than linear in the number of non-zeros for time, and that, that's just to read the matrix. And they show that many of these problems can be done like that. And some of the building blocks are uh, these kinds of subspace embedders. Okay. Uh, this uh, also gives you, okay, so there's another paper where they, they have a number of results. This gives you also optimal algorithms in streaming, in the streaming model. Streaming model, you read the matrix only once. Okay. And finally, uh, but Sirius and Woodruff in 2015, last year, gave optimal algorithms for CUR. Uh, which is the matrix sketch thing. Now, I want to give you one slide without results, but just the idea of how to deal with distributed data, how to deal with communication, how does randomness help in communication, right? Uh, again, without stating the results. So, suppose you have R servers, and uh, each server has a matrix AI, the i server has matrix AI, but the matrices are all full dimensional, okay? Um, so, if, if you have, uh, well, I don't know. Here are some examples. 
uh, that various servers write into, various servers get written into by various processes uh, a matrix, but what you want is a total entry wise, right? It's not as if the rows are partitioned, that would be simpler, but here it's just everything is a full matrix, you want the sum all entry wise. Okay. So in many contexts, it's enough to compute with a random projection of A, like in the last slide. So we have a random matrix P, and you want to just take P times A. Uh, P has smaller number of rows. Okay. It's enough to compute with that. So if uh, all the servers have P, they can all find P times their own matrix locally. We are worried about communication now. Locally, and then communicate, and some other central processor can add them up. It doesn't have to deal with a very big matrix. Okay. Uh, communication does not use the larger dimension M, okay, because the larger dimension is gone in this multiplication. Right? But there's a catch. Servers need to agree on the same P. Right? All the servers have to have the same random matrix. And that seems to be bad, because P involves M. So you, need, you seem to need communication with this involving M. M is what we are trying to avoid. Uh, and uh, those of you who are familiar with uh, streaming algorithms know there's a very classic result of Alon, Mateus, and Zagedi, which says that instead of doing a totally random P, we could use a pseudo-random P. Okay? Then just communicate the seed between servers and they could compute the real random P. Right? And in this context, Kane, Maker, and Nelson have a nice theorem. It says, if I have a fixed vector X and I want to get that the length of PAX is with a relative error of length of X, you need only log and way independence. Okay? If you need only log and way independence, we need to communicate only a log and bit seed. It's a pseudo random seed, only is as long as the number of way independence you need. Okay? And, but we want to ensure it for all X, and that also can be done with poly way independence. So the model of this story is if you want to do a random projection, in a distributed manner, you can do with a pseudo-random seed and a pseudo-random matrix communicated in this way. Okay. Uh, this result is not completely optimal, and uh, it would be nice to improve that. Uh, but let me not mention exactly what the improvement needed is. But you need to improve. That would be nice to improve. Okay. So now, that's all. Page down doesn't work, so I'm done.